Hi and welcome to another Mr. James Accounting Tutorial. Today's topic we'll be looking at Accounting Unit 2, Paper 2, 2008. Let's get right into it. We are given some data here for Henry Manufacturing Incorporated. It's a list of balances from his books, and we are asked to prepare a schedule of cost of goods manufactured and to prepare a schedule of cost of goods sold. Okay, I will not be reading the rest of the question here, the data. So you can take your time and read it through, and when you are finished, you can come back to the video. Come back, and the first we start with the heading. We're going to use two columns, one for most of our workings, and the other to project the total. The first section, we calculate the prime cost, and uh, we start with the cost of raw material used, that is equal to the direct materials inventory, add the purchases, unless the materials inventory at the end of the quarter, we will get the cost of raw material used. The next section should be the direct labor cost section. We only have one figure, so we just project it across. We don't have any direct expenses, so when we add these two, we will get the prime cost here. We will continue the rest of it in the next slide. So we start with the factory overheads and we list all of them in this column here. The indirect materials, any indirect costs in fact, manufacturing labor, the property tariff, taxes on the manufacturing plant building, depreciation in manufacturing equipment. So these overheads here must be for the factory. Okay, mill miscellaneous plant overhead plant utilities. So we add all of them across down and we put the project total across. This total now will be added to the prime cost from the previous slide. And we will get total manufacturing cost of two million eight hundred and eighty four thousand three fifty. And to that we make the work in progress adjustment. We add the balance at 1st of January minus the balance at the end of the quarter, I will get the cost of goods manufactured. Okay, so we move on to the next part. This part asks for a schedule of good cost of goods sold. Notice we are calling it by the same thing or the same name that they are calling it for the quarter ended 31st of March. So we start with the finished goods inventory at the first and we add the cost of goods manufactured. This is coming to us from the manufacturing account, the last figure. And this replaces the purchases in a, a retailer's business. Okay. Then we minus the finished goods inventory and we get the cost of goods sold. So we're using the same formula as that of the sole traders trading account to get the cost of goods sold. And uh, the only difference is the replacement of the purchases with the cost of goods manufactured. Part C continues with Henry Manufacturing. Uh, let's see, we are given some data. Let's see what they require. Advise the management of Henry Manufacturing as to whether they should purchase the thermostats or continue to manufacture them. Support your decision with appropriate calculation. Explain why the company estimated that it would cost 750 to manufacture each thermostat in house while outside suppliers estimated that it would cost 
technology to manufacture each. See? So let's take a look at the data. Henry Manufacturing needs 80,000 thermostats per year. Thermostats can be purchased from our outside supplier at a cost of $6 per unit, whereas it, whereas it costs the company $750 to manufacture each thermostat. Now, um, if we just look at these two bit of data here, we would think that it is cheaper to buy it from outside, and therefore there is no decision there really to make. But um, there, there is a thing we call a relevant course, and not all the course manufacturing costs are relevant. Okay, so let's read it through again. And the course of manufacturing is to start uh, presented below. We have the direct materials, direct labor, variable overhead, the three elements of course. Then we have the fixed course, and we get a total of 600. Thousand, so six hundred thousand divided by eighty thousand units is seven fifty per unit. Okay, we have some additional information. Discontinuing the manufacture of the thermostat will eliminate the cost of all the direct materials, all the direct labor, sixty percent of the variable manufacturing overhead, and nine thousand two hundred of the fixed manufacturing overhead. So these are the items that would change. Okay, now this here is the cost of manufacturing. This is already taken place. Okay, and um, the fixed cost would be a sunk cost. This is not the relevant cost at all. This is the manufacturing cost. Okay, not all of it is relevant. In fact, the fixed cost here of 144000 will not be relevant if you're making any new decisions. Okay? The cost that is relevant are these here. So the relevant cost of is what we have to consider. And let's see what it looks like in the next slide. A table showing the relevant cost. Making and buy in, in this column here right if we de decide we are going to make make it the cost to consider would be the variable cost only the fixed cost would, would appear in both columns and therefore it's not relevant to the decision it would not help you in making a decision Right, the purchase price, you wouldn't have to pay that if you were to make it. But the all of the direct costs would be relevant to making it. If you're going to buy it, we are told that 40% of the costs, you would have to, to, to pay if you discontinue operations or if you discontinue manufacturing it. So that 40% would be... Uh, a cost saving if you buy it. Similarly, with the 9,200, you wouldn't have to pay this if you discontinue manufacturing. So that's another cost saving. And this is the purchase price. Then when you consider it, you get 403,600. Okay, so when we compare that with the cost of manufacturing, the relevant cost of manufacturing that is, we will notice that it is cheaper to buy the product. Okay, Handy should purchase the thermostat. It would cost $52,400 less. Okay, now the reason the outside suppliers can charge six dollars or a lower price is because the outside suppliers are treating the eighty thousand units as a special order they are not including their fixed course as part of their unit course the fixed course is already covered by their normal production but 
Hi, and welcome to another Mr. James Accounting tutorial. Today, we are going to talk about Accounting Unit 2, 2008 Paper 2, Module 2. And uh, we have before us here Wickham Associate Manufacturers of Precision Parts and Marcella Power, the Prime Plant Minister has provided us with some information here. You would read it on your time. I have already read it. And uh, right now what I'll do is read the, what is required. And you can pause the tape and read the rest of the data before continuing. Calculate the overhead rate per machine hour. Two, assuming that Marcella uses the traditional job order costing system, calculate the total cost of the proposed job. Three, calculate the activity cost driver rate for each of the four activities, machining, setup, engineering, and inspecting. And four, using the activity rates obtained in three above, calculate the cost of job using the activity-based costing system. Five, explain how activity-based costing system can provide more accurate product costs than traditional costing systems. First, the overhead rate per machine hour. The Overhead rate per machine hours can be calculated by dividing the total overheads by the total machine hours. And that would be 1,800,000 divided by 200,000, and it's equal to $9 per machine hour. Part two requires the total cost of the job using job costing or traditional costing. So we have the direct materials, which is traceable, 60,000. Direct labor, 24,000. That too is traceable. And the overheads, non-traceable, we will allocate that using, or rather a portion that using the POHR that we just calculated, 4,000 hours by $9 per machine hour equals 36,000 hours, sorry, $36,000. And then we add it up together, we get a total cost being 76,000 for the job. Next, we have the activity rates, part three. To get an activity rate, we divide the expected overhead costs for the activity divided by the activity capacity or the number of cost drivers for that activity. Machining is 880,000, the expected overhead costs, and we divide it by 200,000 machine hours, and we get 400, sorry, $4.40 per machine hour. Then we have set up equipment, 120,000 expected overhead divided by 300 setups, so that's $400 per setup. Then engineering, 440,000 divided by 20,000 equals $22 per engineering hour. And inspecting, 360,000 divided by 12,000 inspection give us $30 per inspection. Now we can take the activity rates and uh, use it to determine the job cost using ABC costing. Part four requires the job cost using ABC. So again, we have the direct cost, the material 16,000 is the same as under the job costing, traditional costing. Similarly, the direct labor, 24,000, same. And then we have the machining, the first activity, 
We activity rate, we just calculated $4.40 by 4,000 hours, there was 17,600. Then set up, one set up by 400, there was $400. Engineering, two, $22 by 20 hours, there was 440. And inspecting thirty dollars by two dollars, it was sixty. And when we add them together, we get fifty-eight thousand five hundred. And this, of course, can be compared with the job costing of seventy-six thousand dollars that we got just now. And we notice how much more efficient the activity-based costing is in a proportion in the cost to the jobs. How will we see provide more accurate costs? By charging to the product or services only those costs of activities used in its production. And traditional costing charges the total cost of production, whether the activity is used or not in production. Okay, so that brings us to the end of part E. We move to part B, and part B is dealing with service costs. And it deals, it asks us to calculate the budgeted overhead rate for each department for March 2008, and the compute the cost of total charges to Ms. Gardner if she spent the entire month in the facility eight marks so we have here a general hospital using an indirect cost job costing system for all patients so it's using job costing to allocate the cost of the services and we have three departments critical care special care and general care and the uh, overhead or the course for the month of March 2008 are presented below. 3720000 for nursing care course, special care 2466000 general care 1920000 and the number of days here. Okay. A patient, Roxy Gardner, spent eight days in critical care and 12 days in special care during March 2008. The remainder of the 31 day month was spent in a general care area. Okay, so she used all three departments. Okay. Right, so first we will calculate the budgeted overhead rate for each department. So they're using departmental. Uh, rates instead of our plant wide rate. But instead of we are for each department, we take the critical care, the total cost, and we divide it by the number of days. We get 3,720,000 divided by 7,500 days equal 496 per nursing day. And we have the special care. 2,466,000 divided by 60,000 gives us $411 per nurse in D. And general care, 1,920,000 divided by 12,000 gives us $160 per nurse in D. Now they're going to use these rates here to calculate the bill for. Ms. Gardner. Total to Ms. Gardner. Critical care, 496 by 8 days will give us 39.68. Special care, 411 by 12 days give us 49.32. And general care, 160 by 11 days give us 17.60. And the total charges would be ten thousand six hundred and sixty dollars. That brings us to the end of this presentation. 
if you find it helpful to please give it hi i am mr james and welcome to another mr james accounting tutorial today we are going to look at keep accounting unit 2 2008 paper 2 module 3 we have some data here for cabal field incorporated and uh, it's a fairly long winded thing so i wouldn't be reading it on the video so you will take your time and you will read it over and when you have done you can come back to the video and look at the project welcome back and uh, let's see what they require of us uh, we are required to prepare the following schedules for the month of january february and uh, march the cash collection schedule a purchases budget cash disbursement schedule for purchases and a cash disbursement schedule for expenses and then part two use the information from the schedules above to prepare a cash budget for the months of january february and march 2009 part requires a cash collection schedule and uh, there's no set format for doing these things you can devise your own format for instance, you can have the months on this side and the payables collection on the other side. Okay. But this is a format that I use um, with my students over the years and it has proven to be quite useful. We put the sales at the top here. This is merely nominal. It's not part of the collection. And we have the cash sales which is 20 percent of the sales in the same month then we have the credit sales collected in two cycles 75 percent of the remaining 80 percent is collected in the month of sales and 23 uh, percent in the following month so of this 140 right we'll get 28 percent and then 75 percent of the remaining 80 percent here and the second cycle will be 23 percent remaining here and the next two percent will not be collected similarly for this one of the 280,000, 20 percent would be cash sales 75 percent of the remaining 80 percent and then we have 23 percent of the remainder here the other two percent if you're wondering what this is about that would be bad that it will not be collected so it will not be included in the schedule like this we require a purchases budget that is we are required to calculate the amount we are going to purchase each month and we have that here the last line now in order to do this we will use this formula here we take the cost of goods sold and we will add on the desired end inventory and we minus the open inventory and we get the amount of purchase right now the reason behind adding on the desired end inventory is that uh, we don't have this and we require it okay so we add it on and the opening inventory we have it already from the previous month and uh, we're not going to buy that so we will minus it and uh, we will get the amount we require to purchase okay so we are told in the information that 60 percent of the sales is cost of goods sold so we utilize that by taking 60 percent of the amount at the top all right that's conveniently put in the sales at the top here as a nominal thing this is not part of your calculation here and uh, you can simply run through it here and make sure that the calculations are correct 
So that we add the desired ending inventory one to the of the next month's cost of goods sold. So this 56,000 should be one third of this 168,000 here. And the 65,000 should be one third of 195 here. 80,000 should be one third of the other figure here that is given in the information. You can tell that it's 240,000 from looking at the 80,000 here. So when we add it, these two, we look at these figures, and then we minus the opening inventory. We are given this in the data, and then to get the desired ending inventory here, we simply take the ending inventory here becomes the opening inventory here, and the ending here becomes the opening here. Eighty thousand will become the opening inventory for the next month there. When we tabulate it to add up all. We're going to get these amount here. So we will buy 111,000 worth of goods in January, 177,000 in February, and 210,000 in March. So we move on to the next schedule. Our next schedule requires cash disbursement for purchases. And uh, this is the same as payment for the purchases, how much we will pay. Okay, again, I have put the purchases at the top this time instead of the sales. And uh, uh, this is merely nominal again, telling us how much purchases. And the calculations are under here telling us the amount of pay. So we pay in two cycles. We pay 60% in the month that it is purchase and the next 40 percent is paid in the month after so the 111,000 from the purchases budget we pay 60 percent in january 40 percent in february and for the february purchases of 177,000 we will pay 60 percent in february and 40 percent in March. And for March, we will pay 60% and the other 40% will be outstanding in April to P. At the beginning of April, that is. Okay, so let's move on. So next part D requires the cash disbursement for expenses or the cash payments. Again, this is based on the sale, some of the expenses, the variable expenses in particular. And we have the variable expenses, 4% of sales and the variable administration is 5% of sales and we will calculate 4 and 5% of the Totals up here. The fixed expenses is given in the data, and we just need to add them up. Every month it's the same, that's why I call them fixed. And um, we add them up, and we get 55,050. Then we add up all three, and uh, we get the total expenses for the month. Okay. Part D requires the cash budget, which brings together all the other schedules in one place. And sometimes it is called the master budget. So we have the full receipts from the first schedule january february and march we bring them in at the top here if we had more than one source we would add them together and so this is a total up here the cash budget as you could see is divided into three sections a receipt a payment and a financing to get the 
middle section here, net receipt payment, you will take the total receipt minus the total payment and get the net receipt payment. And this is then added on to whatever we have in this column to get a balance carried forward here. Okay, so the payments is brought forward from all the other schedules that we did, the purchases, the expenses, and we have an investment here that is given in the additional information, 22,500 that took place in March. Okay, so we're gonna invest this 22,500 in March here. And then we have the total. When we take this receipt from the sales, and we minus the total payments to get in that receipt payment here. If this figure is greater, as in the case here in January, you will get a negative balance here that's put in bracket. Okay, now you have to find some place to get this amount of cash because you cannot spend more cash than you have, right? And that's where the financing comes in. We have the balance bought for it's a new business, so we don't have any here. So we have to borrow 27,250. Now, in this section here, Sometimes you given a required balance carried forward. You put in that first. These three lines remain the same and together with the balance both forward. Okay, so you can memorize these and include them in your cash budget anytime you have a financing section to do. And you put in the minimum balance at the bottom here. This is what you want to have at the end of the month. So it means you're gonna to have to borrow to pay off this plus the 5,000. That gives you 27,250. Okay, in February, when you get, you have a positive amount here and your balance board for 5,000 comes in here. You add these two, right, and you Pay these two here, you pay the interest. You would calculate the interest, put in the interest, 1362, 5% per month. So it will be 5% of 27,250, so it's 1362. And uh, this figure here would be a balancing figure to get this column to equal the 5,000 here. And you do the same thing with the next column, you carry this forward and take the figure here, it's a positive figure again. And you put in the interest again, 5% per month. And this time it wouldn't be on this figure, but it would be this figure minus this figure. This amount that you paid here, right? And you will get 485. Then you take that 485 and you Add it on to the rest and put in this as a balancing figure again to get this here. Okay, so that's it for your cash budget. We'll move on to the other part of the of the. This part requires. Uh, analysis of a capital budgeting or capital budgeting analysis. All right, Greg's Incorporated is considering an investment in a new product line. So let's see what they require us to do. Part one, calculate the payback period for the investment. And part two, calculate the net present value on the proposed product line investment using a discount rate of 16%. That's this column here. So we will use these figures from this column here to calculate the NPV. Now let's see what the data says. And um, this time I'll read it through with you because there's something I wanna point out to you in here. The investment would require an immediate outlay of 200,000 for equipment and an immediate investment of 400,000 in working capital. So these two would take place at the same time, at the beginning of the investment. 
The investment is expected to generate a net cash inflow of 200,000 in year one, 300,000 in year two, 400,000 in year three, and 400,000 in year four. At the end of the fourth year, the equipment would be disposed of at salvage value of zero, but the working capital of 400,000 would be recovered. Okay, now they didn't tell us whether this working capital of 400,000 is the same 400,000 that you have here in year four, right? Uh, we will, in order to do the problem, we will assume that this 400,000 here is the same 400,000 here. So one of the assumptions in NPV is that these amounts are collected at the end of the year, not the end of the year, right? Okay, so let's move on to the first part. First part required the payback period or PVV. And uh, we have here a simple method to calculate it. And now some people make the mistake of using the formula, right? Where you take the average annual return. Okay, but you cannot, um, you can do that where you have the same amount of return every year. Okay, so the payback period is going to be we have the cash flow here and here, the first year 200,000. So the balance will come down to 400,000. Right, so these two are the initial investments. And uh, we start getting a return at the end of the first year here, 200,000. It comes down to 400,000. And then we have the 300,000 coming in at the end of the second year. Then the balance comes down to 100,000. In the third year, sometimes we will recover this 100,000. And uh, the balance by the end of the year would be 300,000. Therefore, the payback period would be two years and 100,000, this 100,000, over this 400,000, multiplied by 12 months. So we get two and a quarter years, or two years and three months. The net present value, we can lay it out in columns like these again. So we have the years, the present value, interest factors, 16% taken from the table given, and uh, the cash flow, the net present value. Okay, so the, we multiply the PVIF by the cash flow and we get the present value. In this case, in the year zero, or the initial investment taking place at the beginning of the first year, would, uh, the present value would be one, and we multiply it, then we get back the same amount. Present value, 861, multiply by 200,000, we get 172,420, and we multiply the second year, third year, Fourth year, and then we add these all come down. So we add these, and we minus those, and we get a net present value of two seventy two five eight t. Okay, and that brings us to the end of our module. Trust that it was helpful to you. If it was, you can give it a thumbs up. If not, you can give it the thumbs down and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.